everyone, my name is Lauren Casaza, and I'm a litigation partner at Kirkland & Ellis. As a chair of the firm's recruiting committee and a leader of our Women's Leadership Initiative, I personally am very proud of Kirkland's commitment to advancing female leaders. The ABA has a long-standing record of championing women in our profession, and Kirkland is always excited to participate in these types of events. It is my great pleasure and honor to introduce Professor Joyce White Vance, one of our lead speakers today. Joyce White Vance is a distinguished professor of the practice of law at the University of Alabama School of Law. Professor Vance previously served as the U.S. Attorney for the Northern District of Alabama from 2009 to 2019 by nomination of President Barack Obama. In this position, she served on the Attorney General's Advisory Committee and as co-chair of its criminal practice subcommittee. From matters involving civil rights, national security, cybercrime, public corruption fraud, violent crime, and drug trafficking, her responsibilities as U.S. Attorney included overseeing all federal criminal investigations and prosecutions in Northern Alabama. She was also responsible for affirmative and defensive civil litigation on behalf of the government and for all federal criminal and civil appeals. Prior to becoming U.S. Attorney, Professor Vance served as an AUSA in Birmingham for nearly 20 years. She also spent 10 years as a criminal prosecutor before moving to the appellate division where she became chief of that division. Joyce has also worked in private practice as a litigator at Errant Fox in Washington, D.C. and later at a firm in Birmingham. She holds a BA from Bates College where she graduated magna cum laude and a JD from the University of Virginia School of Law. In recognition of her leadership of a community-wide initiative to address the heroin and opioid epidemic in Northern Alabama, which brought together a critical coalition of law enforcement, medical and business leaders, and local educators, the University of Alabama School of Public Health presented Professor Vance with the Lou Wooster Public Health Hero Award. With such a wide-ranging and remarkable career, Joyce White Vance is a shining example of female leadership in our profession. I can't wait to hear her remarks today. Now, I'd like to turn it over to Stephanie Scharf, partner at Scharf Banks Marmer and a principal at the Red Bee Group to lead our talk today. Thank you so much. Hello and welcome. It is my great pleasure to introduce you to Joyce White Vance. Many of you may know Joyce as an MSNBC commentator in areas of law and politics, but what you may not know is that Joyce has had a remarkable legal career. After a stint in private practice and as an assistant U.S. attorney, Joyce was appointed in 2009 by President Obama to be United States Attorney for the Northern District of Alabama, an office she held until 2017. Joyce was the first female U.S. attorney appointed by President Obama, and in that position, she prosecuted cases of domestic terrorism, cybercrime, drug trafficking, Medicaid fraud, and many more. She established for the first time a civil rights enforcement unit and then successfully challenged Alabama's immigration bill, as well as bringing other cases to protect the voting rights of Alabamans. In 2017, when she left her position as U.S. Attorney, Joyce became Distinguished Visiting Lecturer in Law at the University of Alabama. And I feel compelled to add that all of this and also the mother of four children. There is so much more I have not covered that Joyce has accomplished, 
And to my mind, there is another special part of her success that I think makes her even more distinguished. And that is, she is one of the most generous and caring people you could ever meet. She not only wants to help women succeed, she in fact does so in many different ways for many different people, quietly behind the scenes, but she is there to help. It is certainly my pleasure to be here today and give you the opportunity to get to know Joyce and her views on women, power, and the status quo. Please join me in giving Joyce a welcoming hand. Joyce, let's begin. It's kind of at the beginning. Tell us about where you grew up and how your family experiences and early experiences influenced who you are today. Well, first, Stephanie, let me start by thanking you for the opportunity to speak with you and speak with this group at such an important time in our country's history and the role that our legal profession is playing in it. I think we're all um, simultaneously shell-shocked, but having our batteries recharged about the important work we have ahead of us. So it's a great time to have this conversation. Um, I have been reflecting so much on my childhood over the last week, I'm not sure why. And so I was raised by a single mom, um, a, a Jewish family. My grandparents were first generation, but had older siblings who would come over with their mom and gone through Ellis Island. And something that I've been thinking about is how my granddad, when we were young, took all of us on these Discover America tours. And I had a collection as a kid. It was a Statue of Liberty and there was a, a little tiny cracked copper, copper Liberty Bell and, and sort of American memorabilia like that. And I think how much my childhood steeped me in American values. It's not something that I've ever really reflected on before. It's something that I've always taken for granted. The value of immigrants in a melting pot, the opportunity to work together and do better, but also this foundational notion that a rising tide lifts all boats, which was really my granddad's operating view of the world. And the older that I get, the more I reflect on how how fundamentally he influenced me. I suspect it was at least partially intentional, but whatever he did, it worked. And I'm very grateful for it. So is that rising tide view, was that a factor in how you became interested in becoming a lawyer? I think it was, you know, uh, again, I'm, I'm a child of the 60s. So like so many of us, issues of civil rights were really important. Um, I grew up in Los Angeles. I remember the Watts riots. Those sort of issues and, and the need to have communities that worked for everybody really mattered. I grew up and went to a high school where I was actually in, in the minority. There were a lot of Hispanic kids. There were a lot of Asian kids. There were some black kids. There were some white kids. But that sort of diversity seemed so desirable and so normal. And the notion that everybody needed to have the same opportunities was something that really influenced me in going into the law, even, even though in my, the early part of my career, I was in private practice and didn't work as a civil rights lawyer per se. So let's fast forward to when you did become US attorney and you were in one of the top legal positions in the country, but you were also in a setting where there were not many women at all, and not many women as leaders. So what types of challenges did you meet and how did you deal with them? You know, for, so for a while in my office, I was an assistant United States attorney before I became the US attorney. And there were several years in the criminal division when if I wanted to eat lunch with the other women AUSAs, I just ate lunch alone at my desk because I was it. Um, and I was really lucky. I worked in a group of of men who either had daughters or were just hardwired to work really well with women. So as a line prosecutor, I felt primarily supported and lifted up. But, but look, I mean, I'm not gonna be Pollyanna here. There were problems that women faced, particularly in law enforcement, sometimes from leadership. And, and I'll just share with you one incident where someone who I worked for, um, came to me after I had been assigned to a particularly violent 
uh, case involving organized drug trafficking. It was a, a nationwide drug trafficking organization and they liked to kidnap and kill people. And he said to me, I'm not gonna put you on this case. You know, you're a nice girl. You shouldn't be exposed to this sort of stuff. And I had to really point blank him and, and just say, you know, I don't, I don't think you know who you're talking to. I don't think I handled that situation particularly well in the moment, because to be honest, I was angry and it's, it's never a good idea. We all know to respond from a place of anger professionally, but I was really angry that he was going to use the fact that I was a woman and his perception of me as a, as a nice girl to keep me from working on a case where the top lawyer really wanted me on it and I really wanted to do the work. I pushed back hard. I worked on the case. It's actually one of the most significant cases that I'd ever worked on. But I think knowing that those moments are coming, and I sure hope that they come a lot less in this generation and subsequent generations than they came in mine. I hope that as women, we can develop strategies together that let us actually lead and control the moment um, instead of just be pissed off like I was. So that's very interesting. At least this gentleman came to tell you that he was not putting you on this matter. A lot of times in companies or law firms, it simply happens that women, maybe after they have children, maybe after this, maybe after that, they're not put on matters. What kind of strategies or what should women do when they feel they're not getting the opportunities that they should be getting? So I think we have to all trust our instincts. I suspect everyone has had these moments, I know I have, where you wonder. You know, you, you don't want to make everything be about the fact that you're a woman, but you have good reason to believe that you're being treated differently. And I think we have to trust our instincts in those moments and look first for allies around us, talk to other people, um, get some information if we can, make sure that, that we're not missing something. Right? Because Look, just to be honest, I always think it's about me. I always think maybe I've done something wrong or my performance isn't significant. I never want it to be about the fact that I'm, I'm a woman. The reality is, though, it just is sometimes. Um, and so I think it's uncomfortable to directly confront it. But the older that I get, the more I've become a believer in direct but polite confrontation on these issues. And I think once you know what's going on in the situation, you just have to go to the decision makers and say, look, this is how it appears to me. We need to have a conversation about this because if in fact I'm being held back or not getting jobs because I'm a mom or because I'm a woman, we need to figure out what the path forward looks like. Otherwise so, it's just gonna fester, right? I mean, you're gonna be unhappy, it's gonna fester, it doesn't get resolved. You may as well rip the Band-Aid off and deal with it. It's going to, something's going to come to a head one way or the other. So have it sooner rather than later, I think is what you're suggesting. I think that's less damaging to your career long term, right? You can either waste two or three years or maybe even longer in a bad situation, or you can just assess it and either fix it or move on. So you were in a leadership role, probably again, not the typical leader at that time in that place. What kind of challenges did you feel you had? And, and maybe it was none, but if you, if you did have challenges, how did you overcome them? So I faced a lot of challenges. And, and look, um, can, can we swear in this? I mean, I'm not really gonna swear. I'm just gonna say there are in law enforcement at least two female leadership styles. One is the woman who bakes cookies and the other is the woman who's perceived as a bitch which is a label that I just really resist. I think when I'm just being, you know, normally me asserting positions that I believe we should take, I know that there were times when men walked out of the room and said, wow, isn't she a bitch on wheels? Um, so because knowing that those challenges exist and you can't just pretend that they don't, I really thought it, it mattered for me to just sort of be myself, but to try to use my greatest strengths to encourage people um, to let me lead our team. And I was really lucky in some ways. I had the opportunity to work with guys who were heads of agencies, but who I had been friends with for a long time because I'd been the office's appellate chief. So I had some really good relationships that were hardwired, but law enforcement folks, and especially the FBI, filter in and out on, on a rotation. And so you have to rebuild those relationships on the fly. And I learned, um, 
that it's really difficult for people to argue with you, you when their mouths are stuffed full of cupcakes, right? So I definitely resorted to baking a lot and, and would always do stuff like that in meetings. But I think you just have to be willing to stand up for what you think the right approach is. And if you're the decision maker, and I was, you have to make sure that everyone in the room understands that you want to hear them out, you want their advice, you will be thoughtful, but ultimately you will make the call. They will all line up behind it and follow you. And for me, an important thing that mattered about getting there was what my team looked like. You know, you inherit your senior leadership team in a sense when you take over a role like mine. Well, my team had been cultivated in my office for many years and it didn't look like me. It was all male. And the, the good options for leadership were all male, almost all white. So I um, invested immediately and very deliberately in diversifying that team. Um, my first assistant was a very young <clears throat> African-American prosecutor who has gone on to become a federal magistrate judge. I was super sorry to leave him. He had take it to the bank judgment and he really grew into the position quickly once he had the opportunity. We promoted African-Americans, Muslims, we promoted women. By the time I left the office, the leadership ranks in the office were really diverse. That's to say that my leadership team at the table with me was diverse. I got really great advice, really competent advice, people who knew when to rein me in when I was about to make a mistake, which happened on occasion. Um, and, and I felt really comfortable with them because I knew that they were where they were because they were competent and they had good judgment. And I wanted to leave that for the, the um, US attorney who came behind me. And I will say, I'm sure it'll come as a surprise that Obama and Trump US attorneys have good relationships, but my successor and I do. And, and I think he must have called me once a week during his tenure to thank me for the leadership team I left them. He, he really appreciated their value and their development. So that's my strategy, have a good team. Well, you, you mentioned earlier <laughs> that when the good team is the kind of setting for that. And you also mentioned that when something comes up where a decision has to be made, you solicit views, you listen, you consider, you make the decision, and then you move forward from there. But let me ask you about the moving forward part of it. What does a good leader do to make sure that decision gets the activity, gets the oversight, and gets to the goal you want to reach? So it's all about follow through. My, my goal in every meeting that we held, I mean, I'm, I'm not a fan of meeting just to meet. If we had a meeting, there was a purpose. At the end of the meeting, I wanted to know what the action items that had to be accomplished were and who would be responsible for them. And I quite frankly suffered because I didn't designate someone to be my chief of staff. I um, wanted to keep all of my lawyers on the line prosecuting cases. It would have been great to have a mean, tough chief of staff who would call people and follow up and badger them to get their work done. And perhaps in hindsight, I should have done that, but I sort of played that role. My first assistant played that role a little bit. The most important thing though, is, is to have a plan and to execute it and to be nimble enough to know when that plan needs to be adopted. Adapted, I guess is a better word. Probably both. Yeah. So, one of the themes of this conference, and we've been sort of talking around the edges about it, is women and power and power. When you hear the phrase women and power, what what does that mean to you? I think the best way I can answer that, Stephanie, is to say this. Um, my career goal was never to get power. My career goal, I think, came into sharp focus for me when I was in Washington, sort of doing the visits you do before you become a US attorney. And I was talking with Eric Holder and I said, you know, what do you want me to do? What are my marching orders? And, and Eric's marching orders were do the right thing. And that's really what I wanted in my career. I wanted to, the ability to do the right thing and to help people. I suspect that there are a lot of women for whom taking power 
means having the ability to do that. It might mean if you're in private practice, making sure that you're doing right by your employees. In law enforcement, it means a different thing. In, in government, obviously, it has implications for being able to exercise power for the benefit of other people. But I think one of the reasons the country is so happy when women are in power is that we are good leaders who, not in all cases, but who predominantly don't hold power just because we like power in and of itself, but because we want to do something with it. And that something is, is good, is make people's lives better, even while we um, benefit ourselves. So you mentioned do something with power. And there isn't only one way to use power. What do you think are effective styles of using power? Maybe that you've seen women use more than men, maybe not. But what, what are good ways and good approaches to using power? So I think the most important thing is to use power with restraint. You should be aware of the full range of power that you have because you have to understand that there might be situations where you need to use it pretty baldly. That's, that's a, a pretty um, easy concept in law enforcement. I was um, actually down at the beach for a, a bar conference many years ago when my FBI SAC called me and said, we have a terrorist problem. And we did, we had someone who had become radicalized, who was involved in some fairly serious activity. And in the course of 72 hours, we had to call upon a full array of law enforcement resources, federal, state, and local to interdict this guy to make sure he wasn't successful and ultimately to arrest him. So you have to know what your full capabilities are, but also you should act with restraint. You should make sure that you never exercise power for the sake of exercising it and only use what you need to use to accomplish your goals. Um, I mean, that's maybe not the answer that you're looking for, but I think the point that I'm trying to make is the more power you obtain, the better your judgment has to be. And it's tough to develop good judgment. It's, it's easy to be smart. It's easy to study the law. Developing good judgment is something that we all have to be deliberate about. You have to learn from your mistakes because you will definitely make them and watch other people's leadership styles. We have so many remarkable women leaders as lawyers that we can look to. You know, we now have the vice president of the United States to look to, and she has a remarkable leadership style. Um, but I'm reminded of Sally Yates and how brilliantly she executed her obligations as acting attorney general in the early days of the Trump administration. And that's such an, I think, such an example of restraint in a difficult time, but a commitment to doing the right thing. We are really fortunate to now have women like that in public life who we can look to. And more and more, as it turns out. Um, let me turn slightly uh, to a different topic, and that is teams and building teams. You mentioned a little bit about how you built your team in the Northern District of Alabama and about diversity. Is there a way that you would characterize certain ways that are good ways to build teams or ways that are not good ways to build teams? So I was given some advice early on as US attorney um, from a friend who actually sort of works professionally in this area. And it was such good advice. It has always stayed with me. It has always worked for me. She told me not to worry about the weaknesses of people that I was looking at. She said, just build a team where you have all of the strengths that you need. If you figure out what you need to be people to be good at and put together a team where all of those strengths are covered, don't, don't worry about people's individual weaknesses. They'll be covered, they'll be evened out, they'll even improve. And that is such fabulous advice, right? Because you're always gonna perform in the areas that you're the best at. Um, so at least for me, that's become a real North Star in team building. Was it your experience that most people learn and improve over time? Or are there some people who just say stuck in the mud and some people who really go forward? 
the people that I wanted to work with were always the people who improved over time. I mean, I, I would hate to think that I ended where I started, right? I, I like to think that we're always improving. We're reading, we're exposed to people, we're learning more experientially. And, and you always come out the end of the shoot better off than, than how you started going into it. So the folks that I like to work with the best are the folks that do tend to improve over time. Um, in that sense, the only way I can answer that question is by saying everybody that I worked with got better as we moved along because otherwise they weren't on the team. So one of the things that has been spoken a lot um, in the legal profession and really in, in many other settings is the idea of sponsors and mentors and the impact that has on anyone's careers, but especially women's careers. And I wanted to see what your thoughts were on that topic on sponsors, mentors, the distinction, if any, and, and how that may have affected you. It's such a good question and it's such an important one. It's so easy to just pay lip service to mentoring, right? And, and sponsorship is often just luck of the draw. Um, so it's an important area to be deliberate in. I think it really does matter. We've all had opportunities where someone has spoken up for us and we've been able to do something new and different as a result of it. And that's not just something that happens early in your career. I think especially the more developed you are, the longer you've been around, the more sponsorship really matters, right? All business is personal. It's the range of people that we know that help us figure out where we can take our talents the most. So. I'm, I'm um, a little bit conflicted about this in this sense. I've done work before where I have intentionally matched young lawyers up with older mentors. And we all know that sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't. It depends a lot on the level of commitment. But increasingly, I'm looking at that through an academic filter where I have the option to have students who aren't students in my classes, but who are simply assigned to me almost as advisees. And although I do try to play a mentorship role, and I think that that's important, it's at least at this point pretty easy to find your own mentor. You can literally approach someone as a mentor and, and pick up mentors. And, and it's sort of like, you know, a therapist. If the first one doesn't fit, maybe move on until you find one that's a good fit for you. It's the sponsorship that I'm increasingly coming to appreciate my ability to give people. Um, and being at a, a point in my career where I can listen to young lawyers talk about what they want to do, come up with opportunities, and then introduce them to the right people, help them get to the right place. That, I, I think, is a commitment that we can all make to help sponsor the younger women behind us so that they'll be able to get to where they can be and where they can shine the most. And it's really fun to do that. I mean, I, sh I should just say, I spoke this morning um, with a, a you know, young woman who I had been talking to for years about her career, who has just ended up in a really wonderful place. And it just, I take so much personal happiness away from that. So do it for yourself if you don't want to do it for other people. Well, let me ask you for a different cut on advice about sponsors. Um, let's say you're a young woman in a big organization. Maybe it's a big firm, maybe it's a big company, maybe it's a big government agency, and nobody is looking out for you, or at least that's how you feel. What should you do? That's a tough position to be in, and I think a lot of us have found ourselves in that position. Something that we should never forget is how much people like when you go and ask them for their advice. You know, the, the man or the woman who seems absolutely untouchable and intimidating to you will literally melt if you ask them for career advice. And I think sometimes that's the right way to seek sponsorship is to go to somebody and just, you know, sort of share some of what you're thinking with them, ask them for their advice about handling the situation and see if sponsorship will develop organically or if it becomes something that you can ask for. It's, it's a tough situation. I don't mean to make light of it. Sometimes you have to go outside of the organization. I think you're always though better off finding advocacy from inside of the organization or as close to the inside as possible. So maybe it's, it's kind of both because a lot of times people work full-time in a job but then they don't do anything else. 
they're not a member of a bar association, they're not in a community activity, they're not uh, working at, on the board of a not-for-profit. Are there advantages to also, even if it takes a little more time each month or every couple of months, what do you see as the advantages of being outside your regular workplace and meeting other types of people? I think the question is almost what aren't the advantages of doing something like that, right? There are so many different opportunities. It can be legal or non-legal. Certainly membership in, in a bar is a, is a critical thing or an in of court or some form of organization, whether it's you know specific to your practice area or not. And if you do find yourself getting bogged down, the odds are that somebody in that group will know someone where you are, will sponsor you for other opportunities. So certainly there's that benefit to it, uh, along with just the, I think, the civic engagement that you get from it. But I have to say that beyond that, so for so many young lawyers, there is so much opportunity in doing pro bono legal work. And whether that's working for a voluntary lawyers organization and doing some form of low level criminal defense work or helping people re-entering the community from prison sort out their legal issues. You know, the benefits of doing that work is tangible. You help the individuals, you expand your own horizons, but you will inevitably grow your network of contacts. So when you hit a point where you feel stuck, you'll have somebody that you can go to or someone who can connect you to somebody who you can go to. I think to your point, Stephanie, it's always worth investing the time in doing that. It, it pays big dividends for you in a lot of different ways. Well, especially in some types of settings where many lawyers don't have any experience managing or leading, outside organizations can much more quickly give a young or mid-career lawyer those experiences because they're there to be had. And people are absolutely looking for that. You know, as lawyers, we are also, it's important for us to develop management skills and business skills. And I think that that point is, is a very good one that sometimes we have to be creative about where we find it. So I'm gonna ask you something, Joyce, that maybe you've been asked before, but what has been your favorite job? Um, it's such an unfair question. Um, I think, you know, I mean, honestly, I've liked all of them. And I reflect on my first job as a lawyer. I started out at Errant Fox in Washington, D.C. and had the opportunity to work with some really tremendous partners, had the opportunity to engage in a pretty significant pro bono project for the Lawyers Committee under Civil Rights. Still one of my favorite groups and huge shout out to their uh, president, Kristen Clark, who's the uh, uh, Assistant Attorney General for the Civil Rights Division nominee. So I actually really loved being a young associate, but I think if I really had to pick just one job, um, I loved being the appellate chief in my U.S. Attorney's Office. I worked with this incredibly talented, smart group of people. Those relationships are still really sustaining, and I'm super nerdy, so my idea of a, a good time is, you know, reading a book on how to effectively argue or reading Scalia's dissents and picking them apart. I guess you've now um, walked me into confessing that I truly am a nerd at rock bottom, but grappling with some of those foundational issues that came up over and over again in representing the United States on appeal forced you to think a lot about why we had a rule of law, why we have the government system we had, whether it was calibrated properly. And you know, it's not calibrated properly in all instances. We are overdue for policing reform in this country. So I appreciated the chance to look at those issues on the ground level, and I, I still sort of miss that. So you mentioned rule of law. Why is it important to have a rule of law? Well, I, I guess we've just lived through a week where we found that out. If there is no rule of law, then a president who has lost an election can stage a violent coup, overturn the results of that election, and hang on to power. Um, and ultimately, it is the rule of law that permits us to keep the constitutional republic that we have, which as flawed and as imperfect as it can be is certainly the finest form of government that the world has ever seen. So living through the last week, I hope that the takeaway lesson uh, 
is how important the rule of law is. And I think the question is an interesting one for lawyers, right? Why does it matter? We can probably all articulate reasons. Well, we have to have a set series of rules. Everybody needs to know what they are in advance. There has to be due process and nobody can be above the rule of law. I think we can all walk through those sort of steps. The real question is, what are we going to do as lawyers and as a legal community to help the larger community understand the rule of law and, and how it matters? Because something that's happened over the last four years that's come into sharp focus is that we live in a country that doesn't fully appreciate that the freedom that it wants to claim is derived from the rule of law. And as a legal community, I think we've largely failed to make sure that the larger community is well educated on rule of law issues. That's a challenge we ought to take up immediately. So that leads to a kind of related question, and it also has to do with women power and disrupting the status quo. I'm all uh, in favor of disrupting the status quo. Tell me why. You know, I think the status quo should be disrupted, right? The, we get stale. We do things over and over. The answer, why do we do this this way, should never be because that's how we've always done it. And I think as women, we are really good at seeing where things are working well and should be continued, but also identifying problems and, and demanding that issues be resolved and that we move forward. I was laughing this morning on Twitter. I saw um, Senator uh, Gillibrand had, had texted something about, well, of course, the Senate can take up confirming nominees and impeachment at the same time. And I thought, how like a woman to assume that we can all multitask, right? Because really, we can, and we can evolve, and we can do things better. And that's what disrupting is all about. So let me ask you a, a question that comes from that. Uh, you may have heard this, I've certainly heard this a lot of times, women one on one, or in a safe space will tell you, well, I'm afraid. I'm afraid to say this. I'm afraid to speak to my managing partner. I'm afraid to speak to the head of the organization. I'm afraid to speak out. What's, what is your reaction to that? What, what can you say to people who at least have the courage to know when they're afraid? I think a lot of people know that they're afraid and it comes down in large part, at least in my experience, to economic power. Um, you know, if you're a single mom with a couple of kids and speaking up is a matter of whether you can put food on, on the table for those kids or not, you're a lot less likely to speak up. And, and one of the things, you know, that I felt fortunate as, frankly, as a government employee was I knew it was really hard to fire me. And so that insulated me from fear a lot of the time. I could speak up and go to a US attorney and say, this is wrong, we're not gonna do this, um, precisely because I had those protections. So I guess the best way I can answer that question is in those moments when people have something that they need to speak up about and they're afraid, we need to help them find safety nets. And that might look different in every situation. It might be a support group in the office that'll make sure that they can't be fired. It might be an exit strategy for them if they are. But look, we are living in a time where we see the consequences if we don't speak truth to power in ways both big and small. We cannot afford to let fear keep our sisters from speaking the truth. And so I think we have an obligation as women to um, not just support women, other women when they approach us and make sure that their fear doesn't overtake them. I think this is really part of the path forward is thinking about how we make sure people's voices can be heard. Um, a lot of the problems that we saw, and, and I know I hate to take everything back to the Trump administration because we're talking about women in their daily jobs and in local issues and domestic issues, but we saw at the highest levels of government what happened when people were afraid to speak. None of us wants to live in that world, so we all have to make sure that we're creating ways for, for people to be honest without fear that it will damage their lives. Let me, let me turn to something that um, I mentioned at the very beginning when I introduced you and that you have four children. How has having children influenced how you pursue your career or how you, how you are as a lawyer? Well, it's been absolutely chaotic. Um, I had my oldest child in private practice. Uh, the day that I went back to work was the day that the Gulf War started. And the partner that I worked for and I were flying through the Atlanta airport to the Savannah River project where we had some litigation. 
and the airport was empty. I mean, it was like a death zone. And he looked at me and he said, maybe you should have waited a couple of extra months to come back and work. Um, this was a man with kids of his own who was super supportive, who was legitimately concerned about whether or not I had come back too early. And so it was very easy that first time. Um, my second kid was born with a heart defect and had uh, surgery and was in the hospital for a very long time. And the guys in my office actually stepped up around me. I literally wrote a brief while he was having open heart surgery because he was born early and I still had a brief that was due. But then the guys picked up the rest of my work and were super supportive. And the agents still like to talk about how when Teddy was little, if they needed a search warrant, they would come to the house and they would hold him and I would read their search warrants and, and look them over. So, um, you know, as a mom, you have to be willing to use some rather unusual ways to get all of the work done. And a lot of your success depends on the people around you. And I was just always super fortunate at the point where my second kid was born and it, things were pretty catastrophic. There was a woman who was the U.S. attorney in Birmingham, a wonderful woman named Carol Privet who simply bent over backwards and broke all the rules so that I could have an extensive period of leave and stay in the job because she didn't want to lose me long term. And I um, really, really appreciate the insight and the commitment she had to make that happen. She's been a model for me my, my whole life for that and for a lot of other things. But being a mom um, and working, you know, you have to know what your limits are and, and what you're going to do and what you're not going to do. I have screwed it up at some points in time. One year I was working on a really important police corruption case and I had been working every day, including on the weekends. It was a tough case involving an entire shift of a police department. And my, my daughter, who was, I don't remember now, maybe three or four, asked my husband if I was gonna be home on Christmas day. So sometimes the kids give you the sign that it's time to throttle back a little bit. Um, I have carried a, a nursing baby into a courtroom with me to take a guilty plea when a judge moved a plea from normal business hours to the evening because his schedule got confused. And I told him that was fine, but that I would have my kid along. Um, a wonderful federal judge now retired named UW Clement in Birmingham. He thought that that seemed just like a good way to work the situation out. So I'm rambling a little bit here, but my point is a lot of um, being able to parent and work is luck. And I think maybe you have to make your luck a little bit by knowing what you're willing to sacrifice and what you're not willing to sacrifice. For me, my kids were always gonna come first. It just wasn't negotiable, but I was creative about finding ways that that could happen. That's very helpful, Joyce. Um, let me turn to one final question and you've given us great words of advice so far. Is there, is there any last word of advice you'd like to give to our audience today of women lawyers? Well, um, boy, that, that feels like sort of a, a very tremendous opportunity um, that I'll now completely blow because I don't have any uh, advice prepared for y'all. But the one thing that I would say is, is this. It is so easy to sort of close up into your shell and, and your closed community and limit your world. And, and look, we're all sagging from COVID. Many of us like me are still working remotely. Some people are out in the world, which comes with its own stresses and strains. And, and my hope is that maybe this is a moment of crisis and that you should never waste a good crisis. And we can use it to think about how we um, take some of frankly the good things that have happened. You know, we've been forced to have some downtime. We've been at home a little bit more. We've worked with family. And if your job is like mine, your work hasn't fallen apart, right? I mean, maybe I didn't write as much as I would have liked to the first few months that we were at home, but then we found ways to make it happen. And we've maybe even been eating a little bit better around here than we would normally, because I can run upstairs for 20 minutes and, and toss some something that's good, that's real food on. So I, I guess we should, instead of letting go of this moment, maybe we should think as groups together about how we make our world look better because of what we've learned. Um, I think we have an opportunity here. And, and I suspect we'll, we're also eager to get back to business as usual, that we may just waste that uh, opportunity, move forward full speed and try to, to get back a sense of normalcy. But I would much rather see us have a more evolved sense of normal that does let us have more time with our families, 
more time for community activities and just to be a lot smarter about how we work. Joyce, fantastic advice, wonderful comments, wonderful words that you can give us to move forward with. And we really, on behalf of everyone, thank you so much for being so generous and so thoughtful and so giving. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you.